exhibited to me, fully formed exhibition graphs and things. Uh, and this is based on work uh, with uh, quite a number of people, one of whom is here, Shunpei Miao. Uh, Nick Samus is at the University of Crete. Irini Kazdagli and Martha Inoa are graduate students at the University of Florida, as is Boran Yezelman. So let's see, if I click on one of these things, I can advance it. Which one? Right one. There we go. Okay. So um, one of the things that I do is to uh, calculate, uh, to do explicit, dimensionally regulated, fully renormalized uh, calculations uh, on the sitter background of uh, graviton loop corrections to quantum field theory. Uh, so, um, uh, so the background uh, of cosmology is uh, the one given up there. Do I get a, a pointer with this thing? Middle button. Which is the middle button? This one? No, this one on the top. Ah, oh, top one. Okay. It's not very bright. Here it works. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, there's the uh, geometry of space time Hubble parameter and first slow roll parameter. And inflation is defined as positive expansion with um, negative deceleration, which in terms of first slow roll parameter means epsilon is less than one. De Sitter is the special case of epsilon equals zero, and uh, that's an exponentially growing scale factor. And one of the many uh, fascinating things about accelerated expansion is that uh, it literally rips quanta from the vacuum. Uh, for example, the occupation number of a single wave vector and a single polarization of gravitons during inflation can be related to the potentially observable tensor power spectrum times A squared, so it's growing like a bat out of hell. And uh, you might expect that with this huge growth, you will see uh, effects. And indeed, with these, um, these calculations, uh, each of which took many months to do, and it, I should say parenthetically, it almost drives me crazy when people just gloss over this or pick one interaction and make statements and everything. These are fully dimensionally regulated, fully renormalized calculations that take months and months and months to do. In uh, gravity plus electromagnetism, uh, let's see, in that paper, uh, uh, the vacuum polarization of which was calculated by my graduate student, Katie Leonard, and in this paper, Drajan Glavin, Thomas Prokopets, and Shunpei and I calculated the uh, corrections to the Coulomb potential. And we get this, um, here's the classical Coulomb potential. We get this desiderized version of a flat space effect that was known back before many of you were born. And then the new thing that we labored so long and hard to get is going like gh squared times logarithm of a, that huge thing, and then hr as well. And uh, let's see, my graduate student uh, Wang Chonglong calculated the corrections to um, electromagnetic radiation, and they also get a logarithm of a. This calculation was done in pure general relativity by myself, Nick Samus, and my graduate student Lin Tao Tan. And uh, again, it just drives me crazy when people make statements about having calculated a tensor loop. Uh, this is the only tensor loop calculation that was ever done. There's 42 three-point vertices, 130, so 42 by 42 is what you have to do. There's 130 four-point interactions, fully dimensionally regulated, fully renormalized. This is the correction to the, um, to the graviton mode function. It's the classical result plus a term that goes like logarithm of a squared, and I publicly challenge anybody who claims that that logarithm is not present to debate me. I will take on any comer. Uh, we also calculated the Newtonian potential. It's got the classical result plus this desiderized version of a flat space result that's been known before most of you were born, and then a logarithm of a to the third. And these things, you can see that even though logarithm of A makes it only grow like the number of E foldings, it does grow. And if you have a long enough period of inflation, then even this small loop counting parameter gets overwhelmed by the factors of logarithm of A. Perturbation theory breaks down. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I would like to know what happens afterwards, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. Uh, and to get it, you need some kind of formalism for uh, summing up the series of leading infrared logarithms. Uh, and you also, if you want to be able to do this in a realistic model of inflation, you need to be able to uh, generalize that, not just to De Sitter, but to a general A. And I will tell you how to do both today, I hope. Hmm. Maybe not. Okay, thank you, I guess. 
little help from my friends. So um, we have a technique for summing, that thing, that summing those logarithms up. Uh, there was a technique developed a long, long time ago by Alexei Starobinsky, uh, a genius technique, by the way, but it works only for scalar potential models. So for a scalar, a minimally coupled scalar with a potential, and um, I think I will skip a lot of the details because we're probably short on time, uh, but the basic technique is, so, so for example, in a model like this with a quartic interaction, you could calculate the energy density and pressure. You get uh, a constant one loop result at two loop order, much harder calculation. You get a logarithm squared, uh, and then there in principle is a logarithm to the first power. If this is a leading logarithm, the logarithm to the first power will be a subleading one. And uh, using Starobinsky's technique, you can actually sum it all the way up. And this is something that none of the uh, dynamical renormalization group people have ever been able to get correct. They get qualitatively correct, but they don't get these factors, these highly non-trivial factors of gamma of three-fourths and gamma of one-fourth and everything uh, to come out to be right. Uh, and, and you can prove that this is right, and I know you can prove it's right because I made the proof of it. The way you prove it is you uh, take the exact Heisenberg field equation and you integrate it once and replace it by something that an old timer like me would recognize as the, um, the uh, Yang-Feldman equation. Uh, and uh, the Yang-Feldman equation, of course, has a free field uh, in it because that's a zeroth order solution of the equation of motion. And when you integrate out a box, you get a zeroth order solution. Uh, and uh, you, uh, um, uh, the way you get Starobinsky's formalism is that you, um, you recognize that in this uh, Yang-Feldman equation, so here's the Yang-Feldman equation, uh, where the retarded Green's function is written as the commutator of two free fields, um, you recognize that the uh, large logarithms, the leading logarithms, come uh, only from the infrared part of the uh, mode sum and only from the leading infrared part of the mode function. So if you just stochastically truncate those, if you just truncate that, cut off the mode sum and infrared uh, simplify this guy, um, you will recover, you'll have a totally different theory. It'll be now uh, ultraviolet finite, but it will reproduce the leading logarithms at each order, order by order by order. And then if you just differentiate that equation, you get back Starobinsky's Langevin equation. So this actually can be derived, uh, and it's true. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing, nonetheless it fails for quantum gravity. And the reason it fails is because of the derivative interactions in quantum gravity. So anybody who's really done a calculation in quantum gravity knows that the fundamental vertex looks like h, dh, dh. Uh, and uh, those dh's are bad news as far as deriving Starobinsky's formalism. The reason why is the key step of going from here to there is that you have to know that every single free field generates an infrared logarithm. That'll be true as long as there's no derivatives in the interaction, but if there are derivatives in the interaction, those differentiated free fields won't do it. They'll still contribute order one, so they're not zero, but they won't generate large logarithms, and you can't tell when you uh, iterate the free field expansion which ones are gonna have the derivatives and which ones aren't, so you can't just simplify the equation at the level of the Yang-Feldman equation. So that's what prevents you from getting a stochastic realization of it. Uh, let's see, I think I went back. I want to go forward. Oops, I'm not doing too well here. There we go. I think I've got it figured out now. Um, so in order to understand this, we applied it uh, not to gravity, but to something which also has derivative interactions, namely nonlinear sigma models. So here's a nonlinear sigma model, standard scalar free field kinetic operator and then modified by a function of the fields. And um, the technique is, uh, in order to apply it, and this thing has exactly the same kind of derivative interactions as gravity, and exactly the same kind of large logarithms get induced uh, as gravity, in exactly the same orders, uh, but it's much simpler to study because it doesn't have the gauge issue, it doesn't have all the indices, okay? And the technique for uh, applying Starobinsky's technique to this model is you take the exact field equations and then you integrate out the differentiated field. So there's a differentiated field, and that in principle would be a differentiated field. And what you want, and the thing that defeated the earlier derivation, was that you couldn't tell which fields would carry the derivatives on them. 
what you do in order to guarantee that when you integrate them out, you've got only the fields that don't have any derivatives on them, is you just do it in the presence of a scalar background which is constant. You can see, you might say, oh gosh, that's impossible to get the propagator in that case, but in fact it's trivial. If this was a constant, the propagator would just be the free field propagator divided by that squared, right? So it's trivial to do it. Uh, the full propagator is the free field propagator divided by that. Integrate them out, uh, and then what you've got, and it turns out you uh, then need to take the coincidence limit of differentiated versions of this propagator right here. Uh, and when you do that, what you've got is a Starobinsky uh, scalar potential model that you can then go ahead and apply his um, formalism to. And when you do it, this is not just airy metaphysical statements. When you do it, it explicitly works at one and two loop order to everywhere we've checked, okay? So it's great, and for example, uh, if you want to know the expectation value of the uh, field, uh, it actually goes like this, um, and, um, and uh, uh, this is the uh, sort of classical solution that you would get by just ignoring the stochastic jitter. The stochastic jitter accelerates that, as you might expect, because it's easier to fluctuate down a potential than up a potential. Okay, so uh, this will work for nonlinear sigma models. And uh, like I say, I don't just make these statements. I actually back them up by really hard, long, detailed calculations. We considered two nonlinear sigma models, and in each one of them, we calculated four things. The uh, corrections to the, uh, the one-loop corrections to the mode functions, the one-loop corrections to the exchange potential, that is the response to a delta function, a static delta function, the VEV of the field, and the VEV of the field squared. And uh, it turns out that there's actually two sources of large logarithms. In the interest of time, I'm not telling you about the second one, which is coming from the renormalization group. And by the way, if anybody believes that those logarithms can be just gotten rid of, that they're not really there, you have just asserted that the conformal anomaly is zero for all theories for all time. Mm. Uh, so actually, the red ones uh, are ones which have stochastic explanation, the green ones which are ones which have renormalization group explanation, and in everything we checked, we could explain them all, uh, and it agrees exactly with theory. We can get all orders results, too, and this is about 16 uh, pretty non-trivial checks. So now I'd like to tell you uh, how to facilitate the stochastic formalism. By the way, I suppressed how you do, do it to quantum gravity, but take it from me, there is a way to apply this thing to quantum gravity. So we do, I think, know how to do that. Uh, so what you need is the coincident propagator and its first two derivatives. Remember, that was the key thing that came when you integrated it out in the, uh, in the uh, mode equation. And for de Sitter, these things were known and I gave them to you. What we need to do is to get them for an arbitrary uh, expanding universe which has undergone primordial inflation, okay? And uh, if you had those things, then in terms of this quantity A, the coincidence limit of the scalar propagator, the uh, effective potential that you would get for uh, the, um, the uh, scalar, uh, for the nonlinear sigma model phi is minus one-half box phi times this logarithm here, okay? So this is how you get uh, the effective potential, not just for de Sitter, but for an arbitrary uh, uh, A of T, which has undergone primordial inflation. And if you had it, you could then at least solve numerically once A of T was known as a function of time. And I'll give you the explicit numerical solution for, an ex for a geometry. And by the way, these other three things can all be gotten from A of T. So uh, what we want to do is to develop analytic uh, approximations for a typical geometry which has undergone primordial inflation. And to borrow a page from uh, Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time, or a great title, A Brief History of Time, it would be just almost impossible to show the Hubble parameter or the scale parameter, scale factor, uh, in a uh, plot of uh, time. But uh, one thing that you can do if you want to give a brief history of cosmology is to plot the first slow roll parameter, not as a function of time, but as a function of e-folding. And this is what it's thought to look like. Here's primordial inflation. It's almost zero. It ends. Primordial inflation ends at epsilon equals one. Then it undergoes some oscillations, asymptotes to a hot Big Bang universe, uh, radiation do or matter-dominated universe, and then for reasons we don't know, becomes vacuum energy dominated. Okay. So we wanted to just make up a fictitious uh, geometry that looked like that, but we're going to develop, uh, to test it numerically, but we're going to develop analytic approximations which will apply for anything that looks like that.
Okay, and how do we do it? Well, we write the, um, the uh, coincidence limit of the scalar propagator as a mode sum, a Fourier mode sum over uh, spatial um, amplitude uh, a, uh, script A of T and K. Uh, the mode function obeys that with that Ronsky, and A is a norm squared of the mode function. You can show that it obeys this uh, equation, and uh, we can get an initial value data for it. So you can solve it even though you don't uh, have explicit solutions. And uh, then you, of course, since it doesn't depend on the angular coordinates, you can do the angular integrals. Uh, and, um, and you write then the, uh, the mode sum as a, a part uh, during, uh, 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 during inflation. Uh, you would write it as a part up to horizon crossing and then a horizon crossing to infinity. And after inflation, you would write it uh, as a part uh, from the uh, last uh, a cross thing to infinity and then from between uh, first crossing and second crossing and then up to first crossing. And so what we need is three forms for this amplitude in that region and I'll tell you how to do it and give you pictures in our fictitious uh, expansion history that show that uh, our analytic approximation is very good. So first off, it's trivial to obtain an, an asymptotic expansion of script A for large K, that's the ultraviolet the part before first horizon crossing. And here, by the way, is comparing the exact result in yellow dashed uh, with uh, the, new, the um, uh, approximation. So blue is that approximation. First horizon crossing for this particular mode comes at n equals 10. Uh, and you can see that it's right on the dot for blue. And then after first crossing, it goes to this form, the saturated form, where C is that complicated function of epsilon, which is valid to all orders in the first slow roll, in the slow roll approximation. And green is that one there. And you can see that after the end of inflation, it's also uh, numerically quite accurate. Uh, after first horizon crossing, some modes begin experiencing second horizon crossing. They begin then oscillating. Because they start from a non-zero value, they oscillate like a cosine. A very good approximation for what they are is that. Uh, and here's um, a uh, analytic versus numerical law, uh, and I don't even remember which is which, but you can see that they're very, very good, except right near there because that's a WKB approximation. It has the usual problems near WKB. Frequency goes to zero. Uh, and Another thing to note is that this uh, cosine term is oscillating very, very rapidly. So inside an integral, that's effectively just a half. Okay, well, then you just use dimensional regularization to write the result for the ultraviolet part of the mode sum. Take d equals 4 and convert integral dk to dt for the infrared parts. And you do that using the definition of uh, horizon crossing. k is equal to ah. So dk over k is 1 minus epsilon h, so that will convert from dk to t. And the result during inflation is this. This is an analytic approximation which is hugely accurate uh, during inflation. After inflation, remember, there's three regions, the ultraviolet, uh, the part between uh, first and second uh, crossing, uh, and then the part uh, which is still uh, not undergone uh, second crossing. And um, I will just now give you my conclusions. Am I about out of time? Okay, good. So I'll just give you my conclusions uh, and I'll show you this graph. This is an explicit graph of the expectation value of A, that thing whose analytic solution I gave you in terms of de Sitter, but now for this uh, geometry which has uh, experienced primordial inflation uh, and then gone to a lambda CDM universe. And you can see that A grows during inflation then after the end of inflation, when modes start to re-enter the horizon, it falls off, but it's still quite big. Uh, and um, so uh, the summary is uh, that graviton loops on Sitter give factors of logarithm of A. Uh, those things grow to be non-perturbatively strong. We finally have a way of summing these things up and also propagating them not just in Sitter, but to arbitrarily late times in a geometry that would be realistic. Uh, and even handling back reaction, because remember, we can write them as functions of a general A, and then you get some non-local integral differential equation, which you can solve numerically. It's only got one function of time, A of t, that you're solving for, and so you can do it. This is realistic. Um, and um, uh, if you look at the mode sum that I got, or the result that I got, uh, during radiation domination, the largest part of cosmology in terms of... Um, uh, numbers of E-foldings, H is falling like 1 over 2T, and therefore uh, A squared H is constant. 
And that means that uh, the finite part of the expectation value of A is actually dominated by this term of the uh, three terms that I gave. And that grows like logarithm of T times the scale of inflation squared. So this is the origin of the title of my talk, A Remembrance of Things Past. This is way, way, way deep in late time cosmology and we're remembering something about the scale of inflation. And this is, by the way, a non-perturbative statement, so this could be arbitrarily large. Uh, large inflationary scales are therefore transmitted to late times uh, and um, uh, generically, box of uh, A finite is the uh, scale of inflation squared times the, uh, the current uh, Hubble parameter squared. And uh, this thing has also lessons for building non-local models of cosmology. So many of us have tried, I think uh, Professor Veterich uh, and uh, myself and many other people have tried to build non-local models that would describe late time cosmology. Um, what this shows us is that if you imagine those models as being derived from these quantum effects, everything we guessed is wrong. Uh, box of A, which is the basis of any of those models, must be some scalar, but it's no simple scalar that you can recognize. I, I would guess, for example, that it should be uh, uh, some scalar, some curvature to the fourth power. That's way, way wrong. Uh, it's, it's got something way, way back in the past times the current curvature squared. And that's, that is what it is, I, I don't know why. Uh, by the way, the approximation scheme that we've got right now is, um, that is for general A of T that's undergone primordial inflation is enough in order to get a, a model of cosmology. It would not be enough to answer uh, other interesting questions like, uh, for example, Lin Tao and Nick and I busted our uh, tails getting uh, this result for the Newtonian potential that's saying that uh, quantum effects are, during the sitter are weakening the Newtonian potential. I would love to know what happens to that at late times. The formalism we've got is not enough to tell us that uh, because it's only telling us how things depend on A of T. It's not telling us how things depend upon um, uh, uh, the variable that you would uh, vary uh, in order to get the equation that would uh, give you the Newtonian potential. But it's a start, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's really interesting. Anyway, I will stop there since that's my conclusions. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, so again, we have one or two uh, time for one or two questions. Bunch Davies vacuum. Bunch Davies vacuum. Sorry? These are done in, the question was, which state are these done in? And the answer is Bunch Davies vacuum. So we don't have any ambition to solving the transplankian problem. We don't understand why the universe ends up in Bunch Davies vacuum, or even if it does end up in Bunch Davies vacuum at the start of inflation. I think those are all excellent questions, but we don't have any traction on that. Okay. No. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this very clear talk. Um, I'm not very familiar with this volume computation in the sitter, but I have one question. I know that, for instance, there are uh, like uh, some techniques to do one loop computation in perturbation theory of uh, the effective action if we do perturbation theory of uh, around GR. Um, so, is there in any. What theory and what. Like, for instance, we take just effective field theory of uh, general relativity and in, we do in like. In what theory and what background? Genetic background, for instance, this uh, like um, one-loop effective action uh, computation, maybe it could be, I don't know. In what like background? Can be like the sitter, for instance. Like, my, my question is, if as far as I know, the only calculation of the 1PI two-point function was done by myself and Nick Samus in 1996. Okay. Uh, if you know other ones, please tell me. No, that's what I was asking, because I know there are computation for one loop for the divergent part, but I don't know for the final contribution. The divergent part yeah. is easy, so uh, and the, well, not easy. It was a terrific, if Bryce DeWitt deserves the Nobel yeah. Prize for that, and his, his collaborators, uh, Barvinsky, Vilkovsky, those people at Tuft and Veltman, uh, uh, so, so that was a huge problem, but it was a problem that a previous generation solved, and we can use that now. 
Um, the divergent part is not so interesting for those of us who do cosmology. We would just say, uh, you know, it gets absorbed in some VPHC counterterm, and then it drops out. Of the finite part of it makes no contribution to mm -hmm. the uh, to the low energy uh, effective field theory. Or to say it in terms of uh, the two counterterms that occur, R squared and C squared, um, the uh, they're, they're both there, and they both have finite parts, and that matters. And we can see it, by the way, in our explicit calculation. But the part that's interesting to us on flat space background uh, would be something that looks like uh, C or R times logarithm of box times C or R. Uh, and on De Sitter, they're m much, much more complicated even than that. So OK, so the statement is that at the moment there is no computation of this one loop effective action that can keep track of this non-local finite counter term. So this is non-local finite uh, terms, let's say. Well, so as far as I know, there's no okay. calculation of even the effective action, uh, the full one loop effective action, mm -hmm. even in flat background. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody, that would be equivalent to having all the 1PI endpoint functions. Nobody mm -hmm. will ever do that calculation. Uh, and, and in De Sitter, it's much, much harder. The only endpoint function that's been done in De Sitter is the two-point function. Mm -hmm. So w we do have, uh, and it was hard won effort, really hard won. It took about a year to get that result. So we do have it in all its gory detail. Uh, but the three-point, four-point, all of those other ones, that's not known. Nobody knows what those things are, and it would be very hard to get them. And in your last slide, when you said, like, uh, this uh, no local uh, scholar. Um, this one is, right yeah, here. Is, there is no way to guess what could be the f no local form of the action to get this one loop correction. Right. Well, I, uh, so I'm sure there is a way to guess it. You just have to be smarter than I am and that everybody else who tried to do this. So a lot of us tried to make non-local models of cosmology. My favorite guess was, uh, was motivated by the fact that you wind up getting logarithms of A when you do explicit perturbative calculations on the sitter background. So I asked what would be a scalar that could give that. And the simplest scalar is 1 over box R. Mm -hmm. So R is just 12 H squared on the sitter. 1 over box acting in that and the sitter, if it's the massless minimum, if it's the uh, covariant scalar uh, d'Alembertian, uh, grows like logarithm of A. So that was my guess, is how to build models. This is nothing at all like that. If that were true, then box on it would just be h to the 4 uh, of the instantaneous uh, time. That's not at all what you get. What you get is 2 h's of the instantaneous time times 2 way, way, way far back in the past. Mm. Okay. That, that for sure is a scalar. I mean. Uh, Properties about symmetries didn't break down. Nothing like that is happening. It's for sure a scalar. What scalar it is, you got me, uh, but I'm 100% I'm sure that some very smart people will look at that and say, oh, that's the Gumby uh, invariant, and, and so it will be. Uh, but I, can't, I couldn't guess it, and I tried really hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I think we have to move on. Uh, so th let's thank the speaker again.